I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Matt Selman, the executive producer of The Simpsons. Uh, first thing I want to ask uh, is, uh, you came onto The Simpsons um, uh, a little bit into its run. I think you said it was the ninth season was your first season there. Um, uh, were you a fan of the show before you were working on it? And what was it like to become part of the writer's room for a show that you had been a fan of? The show was revolutionary to people. You know, I I started watching the show when I was 18, when it first premiered. And, you know, I think it was a generational shift in terms of like how people thought comedy on television could be. And I think you've seen the, you know, the comedic aftershocks of the show in literally hundreds of television shows, movies, commercials, how live action is written, how... I think the the voice of that show for me is one of the most influential things that you'll you'll see in how you know for like family and satirical comedies are written and obviously South Park and Family Guy and things like that but I think you know Pixar and some of the and Lord and Miller movies and some of like the everything I th I think these those people would all especially Family Guy, would admit it that, you know, like the show was super influential. And I'm, I count myself among that. I, I was influenced it by The Simpsons. It just, I was influenced by The Simpsons in then working on the actual Simpsons, not working on something that was similar, but different than The Simpsons. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up, um, you know, like like Pixar because you have and all these other endeavors because you have all these people that did used to work on The Simpsons, like Brad Bird, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going on Jim, to these Jim, uh, Jim Reardon and Rich Moore, who you know done great Disney movies, and Wes Archer, like David Silverman, like you know, I I think like The Simpsons, again, not the part on it that I worked on, but The Simpsons, the the thing that like lit the world on fire said to like smart grown-ups, you can like cartoons. You know, I mean, sure, they maybe they watched Yogi Bear or they liked Looney Tunes and they knew that Rocky and Bullwinkle were was subversive, but I think The Simpsons said to smart people in there, wow, animation can be for you and not just be for little kids. So um, uh, this year, uh, you, and uh, stupid you got, people too. I don't want to exclude stupid people from liking the show. We want both. I feel I feel seen by that. By the way, <laughs> I feel very seen by that. Um, uh, so uh, this year, um, uh, you guys got nominated uh, again at the Emmys, and uh, this year you went with the episode uh, "Pixelated and Afraid" mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. your Emmy submission. And I was wondering if you could just yes, uh, if you could tell us uh, what why was that the one that was chosen. Well, I want to give, of course, <laughs> I give credit to the writer of that show, uh, John Frank, and the co-runner of that show, Carolyn Omine, who, you know, together had amazing vision for like a really unique episode that really, to me, stood out from the other 736, which is, that's the goal, right? To make every episode be unique and distinct from the other 736, but also still feel like the the characters you care about so you know i like that it started from this sitcom -y place of like the kids are worried mom and dad aren't romantic enough you know and then it took it like a, a super you know realistic for us dark for us turn of like what's it really like to be lost in the woods in the wet freezing starving world and then how do we show, and then at the end of this, we're showing a new, deeper side of the Homer and Marge love story, which I would say is one of the classic television love stories, or even human love stories is Homer and Marge. But yet here we're embracing this idea that couples who just aren't romantic and don't want to try new things and are not like traditionally romantic and don't aren't dying to meditate together and you know, do keto diets and that kind of stuff. And just, there is, there's deep romance in just watching bad reality television together while eating Cheetos, right? I mean, that is, you know, that we have to, that's, that's a truth. And it's like, that was like, Carolyn pushed this idea 
so hard and she was i have to give her full credit on that that like there's the deep love of couch love is so real and that's what that's what saves homer and marge in this episode you know and that what makes them think they're going to be okay that's what gets them through it and they don't learn a lesson they don't learn oh we should try new things or do yoga or or micro dose ayahuasca or whatever <laughs> they they learn that like you know there is deep connection in in being sedentary, which is to me is a very Simpsons-y message at the end of the day. And also just the animation was so beautiful by Chris Clemens and his team of, he's the director, and his team of animators, just the way they're just walking out with that music and there aren't a ton of jokes. Everyone likes jokes, but sometimes you don't need jokes. And just that's such a great classic sequence of, beautiful animation you can see that in the movie theater and you'd be impressed and i know people were just i think people were really moved by it you know it's like you can do a simpsons episode that makes people feel like human emotions that's a big deal so bet, bet on that bet on human emotions for the for emmy gold you know it's um it, it's interesting how that um when i was watching the episode and uh you know with and and the whole thing of like lisa being like freaked out about you know how her parents are romantic and uh, i remember homer eating the taco but having the trash can taped mm -hmm. to him and knowing homer over the years that has to be an improvement from whatever <laughs> he was doing before so i think that is like i would i would look at that and go that's wor it's working yeah that's that probably was a victory for Marge that she got him to wear the trash can while eating his taco. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, as you said, you know, you said you're a fan of The Simpsons. You came in, you came into this um, uh, as uh, as a fan. What were some of the, uh, before you started working on The Simpsons? What were some of your favorite episodes, and uh, what were some of your favorite gags from the show? Well, I think the first gag that like showed me and probably a lot of other people that this show was different and special was in very early in the show called like call of the Simpsons where they trap the rabbit in the, in the trap and it just goes flying into the distance. And like, Oh, they just killed that rabbit in a really surprising way. And that's dark and funny and ne you never saw that coming. And I think that was to me like the tip off that that was, the show was going to be something special. I mean, I'm a, you know, Al Jean, super Simpsons co-showrunner and iconic Simpsons talent, you know, wrote so many great episodes like that I think are really special. Like him and Mike Reese did Lisa's Pony, which is one of my favorites. And just the utter simplicity of, you know, Homer at the bat with the, that baseball show. And I just think like, wow, could we ever... Could we do a show like that today with that just is so elegant and beautiful and simple and funny and with so many baseball players? I don't know. Maybe we can. Maybe the well, whatever. I could <laughs> I that show is just a gem. And uh, uh I, I particularly in that Homer at the Bat love, uh I think it was Wade Boggs getting into an argument with Barney over who was the England's right. greatest prime minister. Right. <laughs> and that's like a fantastic joke you were like Barney is surprisingly Barney and Wade Boggs are surprisingly historically literate right <laughs> to, to explain the joke and render it unfunny and it's like it's like that joke is done so beautifully you can never do that joke again like any other joke where someone to me is surprisingly smart or surprisingly well read is gonna to me gonna pale in comparison to that one so it's yeah, like it's it's hard as I was saying, it's really hard to overestimate the impact those the you know your, your your DVD years of the show had on human you know pop culture and society in general. So um, uh, you know, uh, turning back to you know uh, what you're doing now on The Simpsons and what sure. you, and all the writing that you've done for The Simpsons, uh, who have you found uh, is your favorite character to write dialogue for? That's, I mean, everyone, Homer is the funniest. I mean, look, they're all great. But like Homer is the one that really is the the funnest guy to write for. His brain is so messed up. <laughs> he, 
he can be funny in so many different ways. He can, he can be funny in these nuanced, realistic ways of what it feels like to be a husband and a father and to get that wrong. And he can be, he can be funny in, in an insane ways where he's just a human that behaves like a dog or he can be funny in, in that he's, he's just an, an every American who is good at heart, but easily misled and easily tricked, you know, and he can be funny, like you were saying, in the way of a guy who imagines what it would be like to rob the quickie mart and he's wearing a senator sash. So, you know, is, if there's, is there a better comedy delivery vehicle than the performance of Dan Castellaneta as Homer Simpson in, in, in our world? <laughs> Maybe I'm biased, but I'm going to say no. I was looking at a list of top TV shows of the 90s and The Simpsons was number five. And I'm going to say it's, it, was, it was number one. <laughs> I mean, people can disagree if The Simpsons was the number show, number best show of the 2000s or the teens or the nows. That's fine. There is there's a lot of great TV. But I think it's pretty hard to dispute that The Simpsons was the best show of the 90s, for sure. And, of course, the beloved episode I wrote, that 90s show that <laughs> also took place in the 90s. I mean, that, I, 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 can, I, think, I can only think of like one show that could maybe justify being above and maybe that might be Seinfeld. Uh, right, so I, Seinfeld, fantastic show, but like in terms of its influence in the world on the global stage, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't rank up with it in my opinion. One man's opinion, clearly biased, clearly. Uh, and Seinfeld has a very New York attitude that can be hard for some people to grasp. Right. Whereas I think The Simpsons is much more universal. And The Simpsons has more to say. It's, I love you, Seinfeld. Love Seinfeld. Simpsons is like, it's satirical. It has, it, it's, it's observational about human nature. And Seinfeld is just this genius gem of comedy writing and plot and observation. Am I going to get in trouble for this? They're both fantastic shows, but to me, biased. The Simpsons has can make you feel things, which of course Seinfeld is the, the DNA of Seinfeld is to never even try to do that, and it's also to, to teach you how to look at the world, or to or if not teach you to influence how you look at the world to like not trust institutions that claim to have your best interest in mind. I I e corporations, advertising, religion, medicine, school, you know, the government, like, you know, just, just to be, you know, to be, to look at these things subversively and to question them and skeptic, to be skeptical. So, um, how did I go on this crazy rant? Where did this come from? I, they're both fantastic shows. <laughs> I feel I like there was some, I just, I'm speaking as an, as an online Simpsons troll now. Not a not a uh, burnt out Simpsons writer, but just purely as a troll. That's just a, that's my troll voice. <laughs> hey, I'm down for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, in in thinking of the episodes that you've written or the maybe contributions you've given in the writers' room, sure. is there a particular uh, episode or joke that you find yourself that you always find yourself looking back on and going, "Yeah, I'm really proud of that." Well, I do love the, the show Trilogy of Error, which I wrote, which was like a sort of an exercise in plot and, you know, reset. You know that one? We have to get you the season 12 DVD. Um, you know, that, that, like that was really ambitious. I had to prove to the staff that we could do this show that reset the story and told three different stories. And the stories were all intertwined in a fun and satisfying way. So, yeah, I mean... I'm a lucky man. I feel proud to have been attached to this, my coattails to be attached to this, no, to attach myself to the coattails of this beloved show, right? But I do think the Trilogy of Error was like a big swing for the fences. And I'm like, and I love taking big swings for the fences. We've taken a lot of big swings recently with the two-part, like, Fargo streaming drama episode, which to me was like a big swing. And, 
you know, we did an episode that was all Lego a while back. That was a big swing with a kind of a science fiction premise. Like, like we did an episode that was a fake episode of a 70s detective show that didn't never existed called Manichek, which I felt was a fun, big swing. Like, I like big conceptual swings. Like we have an episode coming up that is all from the perspective of going through a YouTube rabbit hole. So there's no actual scenes. It's all just Simpsons YouTube videos made by Springfielders that tell a story. Like I, I when you're in the 700s, you really want to find new ways to approach narrative. And so, and to borrow it, borrow those things from the other, all the other thousands of great television shows out there. That's what's one of the things we do well. So um, uh, we are an awards website, and uh, uh, well, yes, yeah, and uh, you've won. Uh, you can won I go get some of my Emmys and just hold them in front of you <laughs> if you would like to go right ahead. I don't know. That might. How I could see that not looking good. Um, but uh, you know, uh, you've won. You've won a, cu a couple of Emmys. Uh, the first one. Uh, was back in I believe 2000 uh, for an episode we were talking about a little bit earlier uh, behind the laughter mm -hmm. um what was uh what was that experience like uh the first time uh you uh, uh you won and having that be for an episode that you actually wrote um well yeah co co-wrote it with Tim Long Mike Scully and George Meyer who are like three of the funniest guys in the world and what an honor to to be collaborators with them and you know Mike Scully was running the show then doing a fantastic job and George is iconic on the show and Tim has just been one of my best buddies so it was to me it was about the, the most fun of that was doing it with that that gang of goofballs you know and like that we all did that together and you know some people were skeptical about whether we could do that episode that was with a concept different conceptual point of view but I think you know, we pulled it off and it's got full tons of great jokes and it's really been one of the ones people remember over the years. So, you know, it's the, the, the best part about the show is feeling like you did stuff with your team members, you know, that's the best feeling of the show. I hate to say it, it's not awards. It's the like feeling that you and a group of people that you care about and maybe even care about you, <laughs> um, like put your heads together and went off and kind of made something cool that people like, that smart people and stupid people. <laughs> I'm going to be very inclusive here. Uh, that they both really connect to. And that that was like, you know, a taste of that, to do that with my team members, our team members. Um, wait, I had another award story. But my favorite, my favorite Emmy memory, you want that? Why not, right? Yeah, sure. Was um, I was running late one year for some reason to the Emmys. Something had gone wrong. And I, as I was getting out of my car to go into the building, I see a bunch of furious King of the Hill writers storming out of, uh, which not storming out, leaving, because their night was over, leaving the, leaving the building. And I'm like, hey guys, how's it going? And they're like, Screw you. <laughs> I love all the King of the Hill writers. I totally respect that move. I've done it myself. Totally acceptable move to leave when the night is over for you. But that, that was a fun way to find out. <laughs> who, needs, who needs Twitter when you can find out from your competitors? We didn't even have Twitter back then, if you can imagine. Exactly. Yeah. And I think we're probably a bit better off for it. Yeah, just a little bit. I'd go well, back. <laughs> well, Matt, um, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you oh all my God, the best. Thank you. We wish you all the best over this upcoming, uh, over the next couple of weeks. And to all of our viewers, please like this video and uh, uh, don't forget to go to goldderby.com and make your Emmy predictions before the ceremony on September 12th. Thanks so much. Please don't get mad at me if I said anything that made you angry. <laughs>